Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's going to be a fun show because I get a lot of questions uh, from the Upgrade Collective, which is my membership and mentorship group uh, that you should check out. In fact, there's a bunch of Upgrade Collective members logged in live as I'm recording this podcast, able to answer questions or ask questions at the end of the show. But I get a lot of questions about parenting. And, you know, Dave, what do you do for parenting? Like, I think I'm a pretty good parent, but you know what? Every parent thinks they're a pretty good parent, at least some of the time, uh, even if they're not. So how would I know if I'm good, given my sample size is, I had two parents. So I'm going to compare myself to them, and, and everyone says, I'm going to do better than my parents, which usually means you do exactly what your parents did even more, or the exact opposite of what your parents did even more. You guys have heard me talk about being vi curious, vaccine industry curious, in the middle, where you know I'm going to pay attention to all the different data sources, and then make my own decision. It's hard to be a curious parent because, well, you just haven't seen enough. So then, what you do is you go to an expert who has seen a lot of parenting and studied it, and say, all right, well, what's going to work? What's not going to work? And then you look for a believable, trustworthy expert. And I think I found someone for you today. And the reason I think so is I recently interviewed uh, Tana Amen uh, about her amazing book. And you guys know Daniel Amen uh, very well because I think he's been on the show four or five times. This is a guy who absolutely changed my life when his work, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, was his, his first big book. But he showed me I had a hardware problem in my brain. So it wasn't a moral failing. It wasn't a lack of willpower, not being smart enough. It was that my brain wasn't working and I could hack that versus hack being a bad person. You can hack that too because you're probably not a bad person. But you might think you're a bad parent some of the time and have the guilt and shame that everyone has, even if you're mostly enlightened. Uh, not that that's me, but uh, even some of the leaders in personal development that I'm friends with are like, I don't know if I did that right as a parent, but I did my best. So both Daniel and Tana said, Dave, you got to talk to this guy. He has something called love and logic, and he focuses on raising resilient kids. And given that, well, we're telling our kids to do all sorts of nonsensical stuff, like wear a mask only when you're standing on your left leg, but not your right leg, and they know it's dumb, right? The rules are not consistent. Kids hate it when adults lie to them. So they're already stressed. That hurts their resilience. So I figured you guys could use this now more than ever. I've got an 11 and 14-year-old. I could use this now. And that's why we have Charles Fay, PhD, who created Love and Logic as recommended by one of my favorite brain hackers on the planet. So there you go. There's an intro, so to speak, but it's based on years of research, clinical experience, and it's all about resilience. Oh, yeah. Charles, welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and I have to say, there are there are plenty of times, I'll be honest with you, where I go to my wife, Monica, because we have, we have three kids. We have a 34-year-old son who's out and about and a 24-year-old son who's out and about and a 14-year-old son who a lot of times wants to be out and about. But uh, I go to her and I say, Monica, oh, you know, after uh, the way things went in our house today, you know, I have no business going out there talking to anybody about parenting. And a lot of times she'll just smile at me and say, true, but that's what you do. So get out there and do it. But uh, the good news is we don't have to be perfect. And uh, I want to start with that, that we don't have to be perfect. I mean, nobody is. And you know what? Being a great model which we all know is important, right? And usually when parenting experts, parenting experts talk about modeling, I start to roll back in our heads because we're like, oh great, now he's gonna tell me that I have to be a better person and behave, right? And well, truly modeling is so important. And of course we, we wanna do the best we can to be good people, but boy, if we can model making some mistakes. Now, I wonder if any of you are good at that modeling making mistakes and so that our kids can see us handle it with grace handle it with some confidence and handle it with hey i'm you know i'm going to get back on the horse and try again and, you know i i had two very imperfect parents growing up and you know they follow me everywhere now uh, because 
I got to see how much they loved me and I got to see their genuineness. And as a result of that, I took their values and unconsciously stuck them inside of my heart. And so everywhere I go, there they are. And that's what I want for you is, is to have such a tight connection an authentic connection with your kids so that they, uh, they put you inside of them and uh, they wake up when they're older and look in the mirror and say, oh man, I'm my, I'm my dad or I'm my mom or I'm both. So uh, uh, modeling is important, but to remember uh, a little soundbite for you. I like to speak in sound bites. Failure is not final. It's informative. One of the things that I've done with my kids uh, for a long time is at night uh, when I'm tucking them in uh, is I'll say, okay, three things you're grateful for, right? And then you know, find something good that happened that day. And then tell me something you failed at today. Right. And then a failure is something that you worked on doing, you wanted it to happen and it just didn't happen. And then if they go, I didn't have any failure today. I didn't have any fails as we call them. And then I go, Oh, maybe tomorrow can be a better day. Cause you'll do something hard <laughs> enough to push you. And I love I, it. I love it. I got that from uh, Sarah Blakely mentioned that a long time ago that her dad did that. She's the founder of Spanx. Uh, and I'm like, this is really good. So we added that in um, probably eight or nine years ago. And is that a good practice? I have no idea. I've never validated oh, it with it. an expert. And, and you know, love and logic, we, we have been preaching the same thing over and over again. And it goes something like this, you know, hope and pray every day that your kids blow it. Yeah, we, we got to be hoping and praying every day that they blow it when the price tag is small. See, when the consequences are still small. Yeah. So there, so a number of things can happen. Uh, first of all, so they can learn cause and effect. <laughs> you know, and, and how many of us know an adult who doesn't quite get that? <laughs> they don't get that. You know, I make this decision, something else is going to happen. So we hope and pray for those mistakes. I have to hope and pray for the wisdom and self-control to let them make those mistakes. Oh, oh, come in close your audience. How many of you can admit, at least to yourself, that it's hard to uh, allow your kids to, to maybe get a bad grade on assignment or uh, maybe uh, forget something they need and then uh, have to do without it at school or maybe at a practice or something like that? It's hard because we love them. <laughs> but it's a gift. <laughs> It's a, and, and Dave, you know, honestly, what I want is kids who when, grow to become adults who, if they mess up, they say to themselves, hey, you know, messed up, learn something from that. Yeah. Move on. That, that's it, how we learn. I'm laughing because this morning my son's like, I can't find white socks. And he has a school uniform. And I'm like, sounds like a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, I'm gonna have to wear mismatched socks to school today. <laughs> Maybe you should do the laundry. I, I don't know. <laughs> Not my problem. Um, but then he went and he woke up mom who knew where the white socks were. So. Yeah. <laughs> but you said something so important, Dave. You really hit it on the head. Whose problem is it? Yeah. I mean, ask in all relationships, whose problem is this? And uh, we got to be able to offload uh, problems onto the shoulders of the people who really need to own them. And we do it with love, but uh, we do our friends, our family, no favor when we're solving all their problems for them. So this is something that all parents do. When our kids feel pain, we feel their pain yep. because we're connected because of mirror neurons and because gee, it's almost like mother nature wired us that way so that we would protect our young instead of selling them when they got irritating. <laughs> and so we're, we're innately wired to feel their pain and we feel you know, when they suffer greatly from the things. So before we think about it, we're going inter to intervene and help them do whatever the thing is that they really could have done themselves. How does a parent learn to not do that? Well, I, I believe so much of it is immersing ourselves in 
this paradigm and and I'm I'm biased, but the love and logic paradigm is a great paradigm because every story you hear in the materials, the books, the audios, the courses that we have, every story, every example, every part of it reinforces this paradigm shift. And and Dave, I really think it is a huge paradigm shift that uh, that mistakes are great. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna rescue if the mistakes are too big, right? Life and death. We're gonna jump in, of course, and save our kids. But immersing ourselves in those uh, in that language, and it reminds me of a, a mom who was she she was driving around in the car and and a little kid in the back seat about three years old in the car seat and uh, mom drives past the exit she's supposed to take. And she's uh, kind of beaten up on herself like, Oh, why did I drive past that exit? You know? And, and here's the little girl in the back seat. Oh, that's so sad, mommy. That's okay. You're learning. <laughs> you know, mom is thinking, yes, yes. That's where we want to be. So it really does require that that immersion, that repetition. And you know, the reason that little kid knew love and logic somewhat better than her mother did was because everywhere they went in the car, mom had it playing uh, on the on the stereo. And uh, this is not a conspiracy or something that we're trying to do kind of sneaky, you know, uh, against our kids. It's something that the whole family can learn. What's the age when kids first pick this up? Oh, my goodness. I saw my kids, in terms of learning the, the basic skills, I've seen uh, kids learn starting at about age 10 months. And uh, I'll share a little story with you uh, about that. And love and logic, by the way, is really big on loving actions. I mean, how many times do we run into parents friends, relatives, neighbors, coworkers, never ourselves, right? But the other parents who talk a lot, but they never take any action. For crying yeah. out loud, if you keep doing that, such and such, but there's never any action and the kids just tune them out, right? Mm-hmm. So love and logic is more about very few words, loving actions, and it can start very early. And I remember my son, Cody, he was uh, 10 months of age and he's crawling across the carpet towards something he's not supposed to have, you know, touch. And the, we're at the grandparents' house. And so I, I like to teach parents this signal with little kids. Uh-oh, just the little uh-oh, just sing it. Uh-oh. See, it's hard to yell when you're singing. Uh-oh. Oh, and then walk over and just pick them up and stick them in your lap with their their uh, face facing away from you and let them have a little fit. It's okay if they're upset. And uh, we put him down and he he crawled over about three, four more times and we just repeated, oh, oh, right back in the lap. And uh, <laughs> uh, we got home and uh, he was heading off to something that he shouldn't have. And I said to him, oh. Oh, and he just laid down the middle of the floor and kind of uh, pounded on the carpet because in his mind, he had this limit that was getting ingrained. And see, when we set limits, kids learn self-limits. See, you know, they got to have them from the outside first. Otherwise, they'll never develop them from uh, the outside or from the inside out, I mean. Self-control, so important. So you can start even before the year, they're a year old with just a little thing like that. So let's say that what he's going is crawling to is uh, painful but not deadly or maiming. <laughs> would you? And you said, oh, would you let him keep going? <laughs> okay. So here, here's the thought. He's crawling very gradually, okay? And uh, he's going to touch something that is really going to hurt. Maybe it's really hot, but it's not going to cause any damage. I mean, right. it's going to hurt. And so a love and logic parent at the very most might say, oh, I'm not sure I do that. That might hurt. And then after they say that, they go to prayer. Please let him touch it. 
<laughs> That's kind of dark, but it's also perfect. <laughs> please let him touch it. And please, please uh, give me the strength to allow it to happen. And, and of course, parents, I think we're all on the same page here. Nothing that's going to have serious consequences for the kid and serious damage, but it's really painful. And, oh, I, I know an awful lot of kids who've done that. And, well, Dave, how many additional times did those kids do that after that experience? What do you think? You know, they, they're still going to do it. At, at least as far as I can tell, we'd put those little foam things up on the dangerous edges yeah. when our kids are really young. If there is one exposed edge in a room, they have radar, they'll find it oh, and they'll just course. bang their head on it. I, it, it, I swear that if you did a statistical analysis, kids look for those things. Well, and even though gravity is one of the best teachers ever for young kids, <laughs> because they fall down and they hit things, they keep doing it. It seems like the 10,000 repetition thing. And how to not lose your mind as a parent is, I think, part of this. Yeah. Um, what's going on with all that? Oh, I, you know, it, it's, well, so much of it is, it's because they're little and their brains aren't f fully developed. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. And so it's going to take a lot of repetition, but the more real experiences they have that are safe, the better. And so let, let's, let's talk about that. We, we look around our house and again, we childproof the things that are going to cause the real damage. We don't hesitate to do that but we leave enough temptations out there so that kids can actually learn. I mean, the, they need to learn the laws of physics. Kids can learn the laws of finite, physics, gravity, kinetic energy, you know, velocity and the effects of uh, uh, kinetic energy when they suddenly come to a quick stop. They can learn all that stuff uh, by the time they're two years of age, if we stand out of the way and when they do it, we model a sense of confidence. See, how do you model confidence? Well, two different types of parents. Let's look at them. It's kind of fun to look at two different types of parents dropping a kid off at daycare. Let's just use that for an example. That's yeah. an exciting place to hang out. I love watching kids being dropped off at daycare, but I, I don't like police looking at me strangely, so I stopped the practice. Okay. <laughs> That's but, probably best. <laughs> anyway, we have one parent driving up, and the kid is doing what kids do. I don't want to go. I want to be with you, Mommy. I miss you so much. I love you. I want to stay. I don't know. I don't want to go. And the parent's feeling horrible. So the parents saying, you're going to have so much fun. You're going to have snack. And I hear you play a lot of games. And I did background checks on your teachers and they're okay. And you're going to have such a great day and you're going to have so, but I don't know. Now, honey, you're going to have fun. Okay. That's one parent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here's the second parent. The kid does the same thing. This parent feels equally guilty, but the parent knows that kids need great airline pilots. I mean, I don't want to get on a, a triple seven and have the pilot like on the announcement saying, you know, I'm kind of freaking out up here, man. There's a lot of buttons and it's really bumpy. You know, I, <laughs> I don't want that kind of pilot. Right. And so this parent, uh, when the kid says, well, I don't want to go, they say something like this, have a great day, sweetie. And then they lay tracks out of that parking lot. They do not exceed the speed limit, but they get to that speed limit pretty quick. And if you have a kid who won't get out of the car, you might want to call ahead and say, hey, I have a kid. And uh, by the way, uh, she's choosing to go to school in her pajamas this morning. See, I told her we can either go with your clothes on your body or your clothes in a bag and we're leaving precisely when my uh, <laughs> timer goes off on my phone. And here's, uh, I'm going to pull up. She's going to have pajamas on. I'm going to have a bag with her clothes. And please help me pry her gently yet uh, forcefully out of the car. And I'm going to leave quickly. Now, 
Whenever I stand in front of early childhood educators and ask them, which kid was the happiest during the day? <laughs> it was always the kid that, that where the parents said, goodbye, love you, very few words right out of the parking lot. And, you know, we're talking not just about little kids today. We're also talking about uh, teenagers, right? Yeah. And, uh, and they, they need the same kind of response from us where we're compassionate, but we model strength. And can I tell you a story about that? Please, yeah. Um, and by the way, um, we're not on my outline. Are you okay with that? You had an outline? Jeez. Well, I felt obligated, okay, <laughs> because, you know, you're an important guy. and, and it, It's uh, a conversation. It, okay, it's just, there's only a few hundred thousand people listening, no pressure. I love, I love that I'm going off the outline, okay. And, and this is a true story. See, I, I grew up in a, in a ranching community. In ranching communities, all the dogs were uh, border collies, blue healers, dogs that ran after things. They chased everything. They herded everything, including cars. And uh, now my dad was of the uh, variety that believed that kids needed character building experiences. Now, what, what's a character building experience? It's doing something hard that you don't want to do, but it's good. And then afterwards, you say to yourself, I'm strong, I'm capable, and I did something good. So he'd engineer all these character building experiences for me, one of which was playing my baritone at all the different places like Elks Lodges in the small towns and, and uh, uh, Rotary Clubs and uh, all those places, VFWs, you know. And so I'd go and play those little uh, uh, recitals. And uh, well, got my baritone in the car and uh, there's Buster. Now Buster's running after a sob. A sob's coming down the road and Buster knows that anything that looks as strange as a sob has got to be evil. So he tears off after this thing. He's going to hurt it back where it belongs. And he gets hit by this car right, right in front of me. And he manages to stumble himself up the driveway. And I still remember kneeling over him and petting him. And my dad ran out and Buster died right there. Uh. It was a, a horrible thing. And my dad loved that dog, too. He loved me. And my dad cried just a little bit. This is kind of a silent tear. And he said, son, I'm so sorry that happened. And I remember how strong his arms were when he hugged me. And he said, I, I know how much you love Buster. And, but, you know, son, it's time to go. I said, well, where? And he says, well, we promised that you were going to play a, a solo over there at the Elks Lodge. And I said, I can't do it. My dog just died. And he said, son, when we get back, we're going to we're going to take care of them. And, but I know you're strong enough to to handle this. And uh, I, I didn't know how to feel about that as a kid, but I rode with him and I and I played that solo. And I remember seeing him um, looking at me, just I could tell how proud he was of me. And we got home and we cried together. And we, uh, we put Buster to rest in a, in a good way. And that stuck with me. And never once did I think my dad was mean or uncaring. But he taught me that we we can we can get through tough times times that that almost seem unbearable and we can get through tough times when we're also focusing on serving other people and not just ourselves and so you know in in my outline that uh, i put down here there there were three things and i'll, I'll just mention them real quick uh, the first is if we want to rebuild our families, raise really strong, resilient, capable kids, there's got to be a relationship. The kids have got to look at us and think, my mom, my dad, they're, they're strong. 
and they're also firm, okay? And, and the second piece of it is that kids need limits. They need to know that we love them enough to give them the boundaries. And uh, we can talk more about how to do all these things, a little overview for you. But, you know, my dad had set a limit with me there. We're going. Uh, your dad's a recognized expert in, yeah. uh, uh, in, you know, building discipline with kids and all that. So you were raised by a parenting expert uh, and all of that. And that's a pretty powerful example where you're saying, okay, integrity in your word, you're going to do what you said you were going to do and bad things happened and you can still deal with it. I think some listeners hearing that are going, your dad was kind of cruel. He could have just given you a break. But you're a, a grown adult now with your own kids, and you look back on that, and yeah. you look back on that as it was the right call. Yeah, it was definitely the right call, and it had to do with how he did it. So what did he do right? What did he do right? So what did he do right? What did he do right? Well, first of all, all the things that he did way before Buster ever came along. See, what my di dad did right is he was there for me a lot. And he spent a lot of time with me not doing anything purposeful. <laughs> he believed and still does. And by the way, he lives next door to me. We're, we're good friends to this very day. He believes that being with people is being present is more important than doing stuff. I mean, we can have both, but how many times, Dave, do we get pulled into this idea that we got to be accomplishing something all the time or we have to be doing some sort of structured activity? We, we got to be entertaining the kids. You know what the kids want? They want us to be there with them. And uh, Daniel Amen, who's, who's so great and, and really models this, I think, in a spectacular fashion, it talks about special time. And uh, that is where we just hang out with the kid. And there's no shoulds or coulds or, or maybes or whys. There's just us hanging out next to the kid not saying much at all. So he did a lot of that. He did a lot of empathy with me. And that's a big piece of love and logic. And the empathy sounds like this. I can't imagine how hard this must be for you. Oh, uh, and uh, you just forgot to do your chores, right? And we had talked about those before and you had your little list and and now you're asking me to drive you someplace you really want to go. Yeah. Oh, that's rough. Well, perhaps next time when I see those things get done. Mm -hmm. See, so the empathy is not you poor thing. Don't worry about it. There's no accountability. The empathy is, wow, I really care about you. I'm feeling for you. But you know what? I believe that you're strong enough to handle what life serves up for you. And I believe that you're strong enough to handle <laughs> the poor decisions that you make and those consequences that, that come as a result. So I have to say those two things were so powerful in my life uh, growing up with him up to that point. And uh, I grew up, again, in this family where the show must go on. And as I, Powerful as, words. as I get older, and, and, and again, Dave, I can certainly see how some people would hear that story and just, just be heartbroken. And it's a heartbreaking story. I mean, I, my dog is like right, right next to me right now, you know. And I love her. And I was just devastated. Um, but are those things going to happen in our children's lives? Life. Yeah. And 
one of the things that when I when I talk to so many people all over the world and so many people who've lived many, many decades, really wise people, what they'll say is that they're really concerned about uh, the number of people who who can't really handle adversity. Yeah. And uh, hold on. Do we need a trigger warning for this part of the conversation? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, there is great hope. I mean, let, let's, you know, we're talking about some really deep stuff, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you know why I like to talk about deep stuff? Because I want my life to be meaningful. Uh, and uh, for people who have kids who go out there and like they make it through the hard stuff. And so much of the time, I'll share another little story with you. Um, this listeners often tell me they like stories. Okay. And so, um, well, um, this lady says to me, my son lost, he lost two and a half coats every school year. You know? <laughs> my kids do that. <laughs> drive me insane. <laughs> How do you lose two and a half coats? And she is one of them, a vest or something, you know, anyway, she says that I took the Love and Logic course, and the Love and Logic course basically taught me to stand beside my kids rather than be to, between them and the world. And so standing beside them means that, you know, if something's really dangerous or will be traumatic, I step in and protect them. I mean, I'm like a, a mother bear, you know, I'll do that if my kids are in danger. But much of the time, I kind of step back and allow them to handle life and learn from it. Well, so he comes home one day and he says, Mom, somebody stole my coat. You know, and they're always stolen. They're never lost, right? <laughs> and so she practices her empathy. She says, oh, honey, oh, that's, that's rough. You know, yeah, my teacher doesn't even care. You know, <laughs> oh, that's got to be rough. What do you think you're going to do? Oh, Lock in that question, listeners. What do you think you're going to do? When somebody comes uh, to you with a problem, what do you think you're going to do? Real loving. Well, I'm telling you what I, and you need to buy me a new coat. Mom says, oh, would you like to hear some ideas about how you might solve that problem? He says, what? And she says, well, some kids decided to get all their money together. And they ask their mom to take them to the mall and they buy a brand new coat with that money. And you know what the kid said? Coats are expensive. Forget it. Then he runs in his room and she feels terrible. Isn't it interesting that she's doing the right thing, in my opinion, right? Building a strong kid, but she feels horrible about it. I wouldn't well, feel horrible about that one. I'd be like, don't lose your next <laughs> coat. Does that make me a monster of a parent? Like, you earn that. You know, yeah, use your allowance. It just makes parenting <laughs> easier for you, Dave. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so anyway, he comes back out and now he's talking like this. Now, any of you ever hear your kid talk like this? <laughs> and it's like, what? <laughs> it, I can't hear you. Will you take me down to the thrift shop so I can buy a coat? And she said, well, are you sure you want to do that? I mean, some kids just wear a lot of shirts for the rest of the year. How would that work? <laughs> well, this is Michigan, you know. <laughs> so she gets in the car with him and uh, drives him down to the thrift store. And he buys this old coat, okay, himself. And uh, and they're riding home and uh he now he's showing everybody this coat and it's, it's, it's pretty tattered looking. And, and by the way, they just, they happen to be a family that has some money, you know? And so people are like, well, what happened? You know, are you having problems with your business? Things like that. And, and uh, mom said that coat, that old worn out coat that he bought for $3 was a greater gift to him than all of the expensive things we ever bought him for holiday. And so the point here, uh, friends, is that, you know, we often talk about adversity as being like a really hard thing, which it is, okay? But there's a flip side of it. How does it feel when you see yourself working through it and you get to the other side? 
We steal that from people, don't we? We steal the struggle, and then as a result, we also steal the tremendous sense of confidence and joy that they can have knowing, hey, I, I, got, I got what it takes. I can live this life. I can be honorable and, and solve the problems I face. That's, that's resiliency for you. What a, what a great story and what a great lesson that is for parents and for kids. <laughs> One of the things that I've found is my, my kids you know, enter their preteen and teen years, and it's well documented. Kids listen less and less to you and more and more to their peers. And some of their peers have been taught to be victims. And as soon as something bad happens, mm-hmm. they're entitled to a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, the whole victim culture. Uh, and I would just say high anxiety, high fear uh, peers. As a parent, what do you do when your kids start hanging out with a bunch of kids who don't have any resilience and start picking that stuff up? <laughs> well, we're working through that right now with uh, one of ours. And so this, this is uh, this is really personal. It's a great uh, dis- discussion. So first of all, the basic goal is for them to work it out, not for us to work it out. See, we're going to facilitate them working out it out rather than us working it out. See, because if we work it out, is it really part of their being? No. And so that, that's one basic principle that I that that I have to say is is very important. And so there's a lot of times where you know there'll be all this drama you know, associated with hanging out with the kids. And then our kids will come home or after they visit with a kid on the, on uh, Instagram or whatever, they are having a trauma moment and uh, hysteria and all that. And I think it's very important for us to set a limit with them. That sounds something like this, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to hang out with, me and your mom, you know, right here in this room, as long as we're being treated with great respect and we're not having to hear about negative things. So I sure hope you can stay because we love you. But, you know, this is this is a no drama zone. And Setting that, a no drama zone for your kids is really cool. I like no that idea. drama zone. And we have to come across kind of like that because sometimes, okay, here's the deal. I'll admit it. My mirror neurons are too active sometimes. So the kid gets all this drama, hysteria, and then I get hysterical about their hysteria. Why? Well, why do you hang out with kids like that? Oh, my goodness. You know, I'm just modeling what I don't want. So I want to be real matter of fact, but loving. Hey, I hang out with kids. I do extra things for kids when I know it's going to be pleasant for me. And it's just not pleasant when I just keep hearing this and that about so-and-so and and this about that and all of the anxiety and worry, just not fun for me. So that's part of the message. And, And a big part of love and logic is this. Take really great care of yourself in loving ways. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I loved those movies. They were the old Westerns and some guy's horse didn't make it or whatever, stuck in Arizona desert, crawling along, water, water, you know? And and that's like many of our kids now in a desert crawling, begging for somebody to give them the leadership, that that life-sustaining water that they need in order to be successful. And I don't know how to give somebody life-sustaining water if my bucket is totally empty. And so it's the, the self-care and modeling self-care. And you know what? Do we want our kids to be able to kind of dis- learn how to distance themselves from unhealthy peers? Of course we do. Do we want them to know how to take care of themselves 
around unhealthy peers? Absolutely. And how well does it work if we're a doormat? We're teaching them to be one. Yep. Yeah. And uh, my son, Mark, um, now he's 24. And when he was little, we were, we were constantly practicing, we call them enforceable statements, love and logic does. And uh, it essentially where we describe what we're going to do rather than tell the kid what to do. Oh, uh, you feel free to keep the toys that you pick up, you know, <laughs> and uh, a dinner is served until such and such a time. And I allow teenagers to drive my car when I don't have to worry about when they get home or where they are. And I'll listen when your voice is calm like mine, things like that. And, uh, and so um, one of the things, one of the rules we had is, oh, you get to play with us and hang out with us when you're being sweet to us. Okay. And uh, well, he had a friend over, a little play date, and he's four and they're in his bedroom. And I, I sneak around the corner because I just love to watch little kids play, you know, and they don't know an adult's watching. And they're having a good time, little matchbox cars on the floor. And before long, the the friend is taking my son's matchbox cars and smashing them against the baseboard. And uh, here's little Mark, little Marky. He's got a baseball cap on. He takes it off. He puts all the matchbox cars in his baseball cap. He puts it back on his head. <laughs> he turns <laughs> to this little kid and he says, I play with kids who are nice to my stuff. And he just walked out of the room. And I thought, how did you learn that? By wow. hearing us say it over and over again. And so, so much about how kids handle peer influences is determined by how well we take care of ourselves. Now, there's something else. You mentioned something about problems. Whose problem is it? You know, when I solve my kids' problems as a habitual response all the time, you know what I'm doing? I'm renting them a life. Yeah, teaching them helplessness. Yeah, I'm, I'm renting them a life. It's not really their life that they have. It's just, it's a rental. And how do people treat rentals with not as much seriousness or care? Rental life or real life? I mean, when a kid is in a position and somebody says, hey, let's let's do this crack, let's go down to this part of town and hang out, let's break into the store, what do I want going on in my kid's head? Rental life that you know I can just trade in and get another one, or real life? And uh, I want the kid to know it's it's a real life. And that's when we have to have some some very brief but loving but serious conversations and usually i like to have those in the car you know drive it so they can't run away yeah drive it (laughs) along son boy aren't you fortunate to have a so-and-so for a friend well what do you mean well you know i'm just i was just thinking how fortunate you are to have so-and-so as a friend because you're gonna have so much practice learning how to keep yourself out of trouble. I just think that's just fantastic. Think, you know, some of these other kids who always make good decisions, they don't teach you anything about life, you know, and then you shut up. <laughs> you know? Well, what do you mean by that? Oh, just never mind. I'm, I don't want to be one of those lecturing parents. See, you throw something out and then you let it percolate. It's like a, a great farmer, plant the seed, walk away. Great farmer knows I plant the seed, but I'm not the one who makes it grow. And uh, another little conversation, son, daughter, do you think that your life's going to be gratifying and joyful or not so gratifying and and joyful if you hang around with people who Treat you like a doormat. No, oh, no, you just you just trying you're just using that psychology on me. Well, I was just curious about that, and then you shut your mouth. A little seed, not a, not a huge bag of seeds, just one little seed, lots of little seeds. 
son, I know that, that some of your friends really like to drink and then they drive around after they've been drinking and, um, whose life is really going to be affected if that ends poorly? Love you dearly, but who's and that's life? it. Wow. Son, uh, and by the way, uh, if you're the one who's driving, I, I want to make you a promise. And that, that is that I promise you, it's my solemn oath to you, that um, if we were ever to need your mom and I legal assistance because of a DUI, we would never expect you to pay the cost and take care of it. <laughs> oh, that is brilliant parenting right there. <laughs> That's a ninja move. <laughs> you know, it, it helps when you're like me. And honestly, we don't drink and drive. So, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's I, I call it a dynamic equilib equilibrium. Parenting is a dynamic equilibrium. You know, we're always thinking, OK, how can I be really loving and make sure that my kids are well taken care of? and rescue them when they need to be rescued. But then on the other side of the line is, how do I allow them to have enough struggles in life, have enough accountability so that they are strong and, and, and strong people with great character, right? And as the years have gone by, I've realized that it's, it's not a system. It's not something like a steps you can follow, right? It's a process of keeping our eye on that, on that line and doing the very best we can and, and using the best judgment we have in that situation, given the dynamics of the situation. And if we are working on that equilibrium, chances are we're going to make mistakes, but overall, uh, we're going to be real successful. All right. I want to talk about bullying. Oh, I've had so many entrepreneurs who come through my uh, my forty years of Zen neurofeedback program. And this is one where you, you kind of go deep and you can you you can edit emotional patterns, so you have to talk about them. So you get this mm -hmm. peek inside it, and it's really common for people to go, "Oh my God, I just realized I've driven to be this unhappy but very successful entrepreneur uh, because I was bullied." So how do parents? Uh, respond most effectively when there's bullying happening at school? Well, the backdrop, the context is always the most important piece. And the backdrop, the context is the kid has no doubt in their mind that they are loved because they're loved. If the parents just love them, it's unconditional. You don't have to earn it. You can't lose it. You're just loved. What a gift that is when we can have that. And that's, that's part of the context. The other part of the context is that the kid has had a lot of experiences with cause and effect and seeing that they are capable of making decisions, capable of handling hardships. Uh -huh. So, I'm truly loved unconditionally. I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I am loved, okay? Secondly, I'm strong. I'm capable. Okay, when I have a kid who have, has those two basic belief systems, they're, they're a little easier to work with uh, over the bullying. So I would say the first step, if there's steps, is you listen. You know, truly listening and reflecting feelings, you're never going to go wrong. So what you're telling me, uh, my daughter, is that there's some girls and anytime you go and sit down at, at the lunch table and they just move and then they roll their eyes at you. Yeah, they do that. Wow, that, that's got to feel, that's got to hurt. Unbelievable. I mean, tell me, you know, how is this, how often is this happening? So I'm having a conversation and all I'm doing is getting at feelings and trying to understand. 
I'm not trying to solve the problem. See, too often we just jump into problem solving mode before we listen and then things go poorly. <laughs> kind of like when our spouse has a bad day, you know, and we want to be good listeners and empathetic and no information shared whatsoever during that first stage. Oh, hand on the shoulder of the kid. Just love you. Yeah. And I'm so sad that you're having to go through this stuff. Yeah. And then I kind of start moving into a little more directive role. Uh, would you like to hear some thoughts? Are you Absolutely. Interested? You know, okay. Because the kid's interested in hearing it because I've spent time listening. Okay, so, so you're getting them, you're soliciting them to ask for advice, okay. Yeah, so, so, but I'm going to ask permission first. So, son, do you, would you like to hear some ideas about how to handle kids like that? Or, I mean, what do you think? Well, I guess, you know, okay, yeah. Because I don't, I don't want to be bossy or anything, but I know you're really hurting. Uh, now, some kids always use that language. Some kids or some people decide to. Well, some people decide to uh, trick that kid. And when the kid is uh, hassling them, they say to themselves, the more upset I get, the more unhealthy power that person has. And they, they kind of do a good job of acting you know, like, like a really good actor does. And then they just have something just kind of relaxed, they say to the kid. So we could practice that if you're interested. Well, that's weird, dad. What do you, what do you mean? Well, you know, some kids just, they kind of put on a cool look or a relaxed look and they don't have a lot of eye contact with the bully, but the bully says, well, you're just, you're just such and such, you know? And, uh, and, uh, uh the, the kid might say something like, oh, I was really wondering about that. Thank you. You know, and, and then they just wander over and stand next to an adult or some kids they know will be uh, kind to them, kind of watch out for them. But they don't say anything to that other, uh, that, that, that bully right then and there. They might talk to a teacher later on. But they just kind of wander over and hang out by somebody who's going to take good care of them. So how do you think that might work? Oh, I don't know. It seems kind of weird. You know, and, well, it, it might be weird. And do you think it's possible that it, it, it might not work all the time, just like everything else? I always get kids prepared for the fact that sometimes things won't work. Yeah. What happens then? Yeah. So what do you think you might do if it doesn't work? Well, depending on the bully, some kids decide. And again, this is where judgment really has to come in, parents. Okay. Some kids decide to look at that bully and just say something like this. That's bullying and that needs to stop. And they turn away and they walk somewhere where they won't get beat up. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> some kids only understand that type of approach. Now, you know, this is a process. But notice what I'm trying to do here. Most of the time, I am, most of the time, I am going for giving the kid the skills they need in order to handle not just this bully, but all the other bullies they will encounter for the rest of their lives. Because if they run a business, they'll run into bullies. If they work in a business, they'll run into bullies. If they live life, they will run into bullies. It's and very true. What's so interesting is when kids have that confidence of knowing that they can handle bullies, they don't get bullied as much. It just kind of oozes out of them. It's kind of like, hey, I can handle you. You know, I can handle life. Now, there are times when 
a parent may need to say something like this. Now, some kids decide that they really are going to need to get some extra help from people at the school. Okay. And they're going to ask their parent to go to the school with them. And they're going to talk to the, the principal uh, with their parent there. Now, notice who's still involved in solving the problem. The kid. Now, I'd probably call the principal ahead of time and say, we got the situation. I'd like to bring my son in and have uh, him talk directly to you because I want him to be empowered to know that he can handle himself. And so I just want you to know why I'm probably going to be fairly silent. <laughs> there's, there's method to the madness here. Okay. Okay. And then if I need to, I'll throw some things in. Uh, but very important for the kid not to be sitting back, you know, the feet up in the air, you know, just kind of glazed over while I'm solving the problem. Okay. And so uh, there are times where we have to go to that level. And I have actually seen times where, uh, you know, parents have had to go and, and uh, this is the last resort, of course, but take some legal action or whatever is required to resolve the issue. But so much of this can be handled with the kid just learning some very simple kind of silly strategies of showing for showing the bully they just aren't bothered so much i i love that yeah i i had a kid i'll show, share with you one little fun story the, the kid was always hassling him about his mom your mama mm -hmm. does this your mama does that and so he goes to this kid the next time the kid says it and he says, you know, I've been thinking about that and I've tried to get her to stop doing that stuff, but she just won't listen to me. <laughs> and he walked away <laughs> and the bully actually laughed, you know, it was kind of the end of the story there. So anyway, just had to share that with you. So the, those are the, the positive endings. Um, there's also the bully who keeps hitting you whenever there's not a teacher around kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when we need to believe our kids and, uh, and, and if we have to make a change to a different school or a different situation, it's worth it because it's that destructive. I, I was in that situation with one of the kids a, a while ago. And finally, I said, all right, here's the deal. Um, if you can't get away and there's no teacher, then what you do is you hit them really hard and then they'll stop hitting you. Right? <laughs> and this is actually yeah. how school has worked throughout yeah. all of human history. Uh, and True. that's just how it is. Um, actually, I'm, this was my daughter. And she says, but it would probably hurt my hand. I said, yeah, but it'll hurt their face more. And you only have to do it once, <laughs> right? And it's not like this kid hasn't hit you dozens of times. And finally, I said, look, if you have to do it, she goes, I'll get in trouble. I said, yeah, but if you'll get a day off school and I'll buy you ice cream. Like, it's okay. <laughs> You're allowed to protect yourself if you need to protect yourself and your yeah. teacher isn't doing your job. Well, right? I have... Yeah. I don't know if that was the right the right parenting answer. The teacher sure didn't like it when I told the teacher about it. Yeah, um, it, but, it falls under the category of uh, fairly solid advice that is politically incorrect. <laughs> 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 yeah, but but one of the things that we see is that that bullies they play by a different set of rules, like real yeah. real bullies, aggressive people, sociopathic people play by a different set mm -hmm. of rules. And uh, I had one in my life when I was uh, 13 years of age and I was a pretty passive kid, but yeah, we, uh, it, I had a three day in school suspension as a result of solving that problem. I'll put it that way. And uh, it was one of the best decisions I'd ever made in my life. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, it, it's it's sad because sometimes we're you know, 10, 11, 12 year olds, you know, there's police on campus and they're over enforcing yeah. it. And sometimes a scuffle happens, right? And uh, I, I think that's missing from school. I wish I hadn't been bullied. Uh, I'm also glad that when I was bullied and there was no teacher around that I protected myself because otherwise I think I would have grown up to be a victim. And that's what I wanted most for my kids. I, I don't care if you miss some school or not, but you'll learn that it's okay to protect yourself. And that's what I told the teacher. 
you know, when my daughter's off in college mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's an aggressive person uh, who won't stop, it's up to you to stop them if you can't get help. Right. And right. I, I feel like like that's missing from a lot of our schooling, but I'm yeah, glad most well, people don't get and, bullied, or at least many don't. And the issue is we already have enough victims. <laughs> Well you know, said. it's like we just don't need any more. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I love the idea of raising kids who understand that, uh, of course, we want to handle things with great honor and respect towards other people, great love. But uh, there are times where we have to get pretty strong to make a point. Yeah, uh, sometimes you do. And and. Let's let's talk about that in the context of the pandemic. Okay, parenting the pandemic. I've seen people, lots of followers. There are kids who are getting bullied for getting the vaccine, and there are kids who are getting bullied for not getting the vaccine, or for wearing a mask, or not wearing a mask. And yeah. there's all this weird tribal polarized behavior yeah. uh, around people trying to force other people to do whatever makes them feel safe, regardless of science. You know, it, it's not a logic. Right. It, it's right. it's an emotional discussion. How do kids mm-hmm. handle that? And how do parents help kids handle the weird social pressures around illogical behaviors? Well, uh, I, I think that as parents, we are we welcome discussion about it, of course, in our house. So we're discussing things and we're discussing the concept of freedom. Freedom is precious. See, the problem is, is that freedom, now here I go, okay, (laughs) warning, warning, right? (laughs) Uh, Freedom is expensive. Freedom comes at a risk. And uh, freedom terrifies so many people that when they see other people uh, enjoying freedoms, even when those freedoms don't hurt anybody, it's threatening to them, okay? Okay. Freedom is a threatening thing for a whole lot of people. And it really, in our home and in the love and logic philosophy, you know, I'm, I'm all about, you know, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. In our family, we are going to live free. We are not going to uh, be abusive or hassle people who are ex- exercising their freedoms that are not impinging on ours. We are going to respect those. We may not agree, but uh, this is just what the value is in the Fay household. And so uh, what can you say? So I'm a real big fan of, okay, let's talk about what you can say to somebody if they hassle you about, well, how come you're vaccinated or how come you're not vaccinated or how come you have a blue mask instead of a purple one or how come you only have three instead of four on at the time? (laughs) You know, it's like all this stuff. Okay, how am I going to respond in a way where I do my best to maintain the dignity of both people involved. Wow. Mm. Well, maintaining how, dignity. How come you're how come you're not wearing a mask? It, because it's my personal decision and it's my freedom. And because we're not being required to now. Very uh, very well put. Uh, I've seen a lot of frustration for my kids. And they'll say, Daddy, Mm -hmm. last week it was safe for me to have recess without a mask on. And this week it's not. But the government rules say that I don't have to wear a mask, but the school says that I do. And they didn't make me wear a mask when I was standing with Susie, but I had to wear the mask when I was sitting in my first class and not my second mask. And they look at me with like, with pain. And they say, it doesn't make any sense. It isn't doing anything because we're not doing anything consistently. What's a good parenting answer to that? Because I've been struggling with that. Well, I think you handled it very well. It doesn't make sense. (laughs) One of the things that will make you crazy is here's here's how to make yourself crazy or make somebody else crazy, just in case you want to know how to do that. 
you 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 try to make sense out of something that doesn't, and you obsess yeah. over it. You're like, I got to figure out how this makes sense. Okay, the truth of it is, is it don't make no sense. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Don't make no sense. Okay, and the way I've explained it uh, to my son is that you know there's a lot of people they're truly trying to help in in their hearts they're they're trying to do the right thing they have all different perspectives on this most people honestly most people are just trying to live their lives they're trying to love their kids they're trying to love their family they're trying to make a living they just want to get through the day with some joy in their hearts and 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 that's that's all it's about. And and some of those people wear masks, some of them don't, some of them are vaccinated, some of them are not. But they're just good people and they're trying to make the best decision they can, given the fact that none of us know anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right? Okay. And I, and but uh, let's let's not pretend that that this makes any sense. Okay. So, Critique what I did as a parent here. Tell me what I could have done better, whether this worked. I said, kids, sometimes you wear a mask so the muggles feel safe. And you know very well that it doesn't do anything at all, but you're just doing it because it's less work and it makes other people feel safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's other times where you are allowed to choose not to do it, but you get the consequences of choosing not to do it, which can be uh -huh. social shaming or someone not letting you into the store or someone yelling at you or you know, what, whatever the deal is. Uh, and, and you get to pick, right? And I'll support you either way. Is that a parenting win or the muggles thing was judging and shaming and all that? But well, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't want to be judgy and shaming with you because, you know, uh, uh, when I, I figure when I get my act together completely, then I'll, you know, really, I mean, totally flawless, then I'll be in a good place to judge other people. <laughs> okay. So, but with that said, I would probably, my delivery would be slightly different, but not that yeah, much. How would you do it? I, my response, let, let me see if I can put, put, put myself right in the mood there. I'd say, you know, I'd say some people truly are scared. And some people are just, uh, you know, they don't have any choice because they work someplace and it's required or whatever. And sometimes we just show people love by doing things that make their lives easier, you know? And it's kind of a little sacrifice we make, but we don't have to do it a lot. You know, fortunately it's becoming less and less. And I have to say, I, I, I do that as well. It's been my stance on it. If somebody's uncomfortable and, you know, I'll, I'll do such and such, you know, just to kind of help them feel more comfortable because I, I don't want to be mean. Okay, but uh, when I am in a situation where I get to make my own choice, then I get to make my own choice. And uh, so uh, that's pretty similar, I think, to what, what you said, Dave. Uh, yeah, everybody's going to have a different take on it. Um, I, I like what you said there. Sometimes you choose to wear it out of love because the other person's afraid or they're mm -hmm. required to, and you're just doing it to be nice. Uh, even though it's dumb. <laughs> so <laughs> that dichotomy is the hard part for teenagers, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and the problem, the, the great thing about being a teenager is that suddenly your brain develops to a certain extent and you realize that things don't make sense. Yeah. It's like when you're little, you know, and everything makes sense. Everything is right with the world, you know? And then all of a sudden your brain shifts and you're like, my parents have stupid rules. Like, you know, it's like my mom, bless her heart. I mean, uh, she, you know, we, we couldn't have sodas in the car. Okay. Cause they were glass bottles and, you know, we couldn't have lollipops in the car cause they jammed down our throat, but we could ride in the back of the pickup truck down the highway <laughs> with like a chainsaw loose in there sliding back and forth. <laughs> it's like, and when you're a teenager, all of a sudden you're like, what? This is nuts. And um, with teenagers, so much of it is listening and not automatically judging 
and then asking if they'd like your thoughts. So I think such and such, and, and inside you're going, ah, you know, I can't believe this kid said that. Well, tell me more about that. Why do you think it would be okay for, why do you think it's okay for people to do any drugs they want to do? You know, let's say the kid says something like that, because mm -hmm. they will, right? Just to yep. shock us. What, what do you, what do you think the pros are of that? You know, like the good part of it and they'll share stuff that'll just, yeah, you know, but you're listening, trying to keep a straight face and then, you know, just going, Oh, so tell yeah, great. Do you see any cons with it? You know, like bad things about it. And it's like, no, it's all good. You know? And, and that's when uh, you can say, Hey, you know, would you be interested in my thoughts as long as I don't judge you or tell you what to do? <sighs> I guess. You know? And then it's like, you know, I suppose that at some point I may have believed some of those things. And then I got to see a lot of people that I love dearly um, start to experiment with, with drugs and saw some lose their lives and others lose their wives and others lose their kids and, and everything in between and uh -huh. kind of changed my thoughts on it. But the great thing about it is you have a powerful mind inside of that skull of yours. That's the great thing. And then you close it up. And you know, the interesting piece about this is that they come back around as long as you're not fighting with them about it. You know, Nine times out of 10, if you're not fighting the power struggle, they come back around, you know, and then you're, they're like 25 or whatever. And you're, they're saying things like, well, really think it's inappropriate that people they legalized all these, you know, like, wow, you know, what happened? It's a miracle. No, it was great bonding. And you didn't ruin the relationship by fighting with the teenager when they were pushing buttons. Wow. It's a, it's a complex path. And I, I, mm -hmm. I love the way you're sharing this actionable advice because I'm always you know, replaying the day this conversation. I wonder what else you could have done, but honestly, the, the set of, of options to pull from, uh, when you're doing it is relatively limited. So you don't really know where to go to get info as a parent. We talk to other yeah. parents and all this. So I, I appreciate what you've been sharing on the show and um, you have all of this put together at loveandlogic.com is, is yeah, your URL yeah. for this. Uh -huh. And it, it's pretty neat. And the the frameworks you have, uh, I went through them after uh, Dr. Amen recommended it. And just this whole idea that there's only five things you have to do, I want to recap that, sort of the five non-negotiable core principles. Can you walk people through those as oh, we wrap sure. up yeah. the show? There's five core principles. They're pretty broad, okay, but they really do nail it down. And and uh, the first one is that I, I want to handle the kid with mutual dignity. So my dignity is intact and the kid's dignity is intact. And the, and the biggest issue there is, is limits. Can't be any dignity in the home if there aren't limits. Okay. Another piece of it is shared thinking. Now you heard a lot of that today where we're asking the kid, what do you think you're going to do to solve this problem? See, I should never be consistently thinking harder about my kids' problems than they are. Another piece of it is shared control. That's the third one, shared control. So I want to give away the control that I don't have or need. You know, do you want to be home by 10 or 1030? You decide, hey, do you want to do you want to have uh, carrots or celery? Just little choices. Bombard them with that stuff. Lots of control. People love control. The mm -hmm. more you give away, the more you have. The more you hoard, the less you have. And uh, so then we have empathy, sincere empathy. And, oh, that that's what sends the message that I'm on your side, kid. And when I am on your side, kid, uh, the, the hard part for the kid is that they have to think about their own poor decision rather than blaming us for what they did. And, you know, these, these four things all boil down into relationship. So number five is relationship. It is... Uh, how are we going to connect with this kid where the kid actually puts our values inside their heart? 
And uh, I, I have to say, my my mom struggled with uh, bipolar depression. Uh, she struggled with all sorts of trauma and and pain and anxiety, and she really struggled with parenting. But you know, one thing she consistently did is she didn't give up. She just didn't give up. And she consistently sent this message to us kids. You're the apple of my eye. It's that simple. (laughs) You're the apple of my eye. And when you make decisions, you'll need to get yourself (laughs) out of your messes, (laughs) that kind of thing. But she struggled a lot. And She had such a profound impact on me and she passed away a few years back. But, you know, she's like I said, she's always with me, just hanging out there. And now she's this strong person who doesn't have that that terrible illness or those struggles. And now her voice is in my head saying things like you can do this and doing the right thing for people is the right thing to do and when you mess up that's okay you just get back on that horse and you'll be okay and here we have a person who really struggled with life who had such a big impact i I think that that gives all of us a lot of hope i like that a lot Uh, when uh, when people struggle uh, and overcome and you know, still do their best and end up being uh, being good parents despite whatever got in the way. Uh, it's one of the hardest things you can do uh, as yeah. a human being because it, it's a, one of those jobs that's unpredictable, never stops. You don't get to take a break when you want to. Right. Uh, so my my full respect to people who who parent and do their best, and my full respect to people who say, you know, I decided I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a whole yeah. lot of work and I had other priorities. I get it, guys. <laughs> it's all good yeah. either way. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, thank you, uh, Charles, Faye, and thanks for Love and Logic. And thank also you. thanks, thanks Daniel and uh, Tana Amen for uh, bringing you to my attention because uh, I hadn't heard about your work. But it's it's a logical, useful framework, and it's got a lot of really cool parenting ninja moves in it. So I'm I'm learning from it, and I thought a lot of our guests would enjoy that. I don't know what percentage of people have kids who listen, but it's a meaningful percentage, I would imagine. So guys, hope you enjoyed it. And if you listened and you didn't have kids, just think what your parents did to you and what it installed in you. And the next time you talk to a little kid, even if it's not yours, maybe there's something in here for you. Again, that's loveandlogic.com. Yeah, thank you so much. Such a joy. And I'm so thankful that I didn't have to follow my outline. That was fun. I wouldn't be doing my job right if you had to follow an outline. (laughs) All right, guys, I will see you on the next show. Thank you, Upgrade Collective, for tuning in live. Um, I didn't mention it, but I normally do live questions. But they're like, Dave, every question that we wanted to ask, you already asked. So they're all waving at me right now. Guys, if, if you are thinking about this, For one monthly fee, me and my team answer all of your questions. You get two calls with me every month and you get two calls with my coaching team and a vibrant community supporting you, learning about all the biohacking stuff. I teach you all my books and courses for free. It's probably the best deal you'll ever get. Go to ourupgradecollective.com and sign up and join a lot of people having a lot of fun. And this is also uncensored. This is the stuff I can say that's not on public websites. So you want to get inside my head, ourupgradecollective.com. And again, our guest today, loveandlogic.com. I'll see you all on the next episode.